Pakistan. And before introducing our speakers, uh, I would like first to welcome our um, uh, participants on Zoom and welcome our participants on here. We do have more people around in the office and everyone is so busy having meetings. They are just slowly, slowly moving into the room. Um, and let's just again, before that, uh, uh, tell you a little bit about our MBL lecture. Our MBL lecture is every Tuesday, and we normally have um, a make a mini series, sometimes a longer series, about a, a topic, and especially a cutting edge topic, and invite um, scholars to give us. Uh, a lecture in that area, and normally those some of those lectures will be developed and published in our also as an article in our transformation journal. Uh, the our MBL lecture is from January to July, and then we will have around two months break, and that is why you haven't heard from us during the August. And, and, and July, because normally July and August is a break. And uh, this is our first lecture for this new academic year. And we are starting our first lecture on religious um, contextualization of religious conversion. And uh, it will be five lectures around that area. And you or hopefully you all have received um, our MBL uh, during the month of September lectures. This week we have Dr. Maksud. Very soon I will introduce him to you. Next week we will have Dr. Donna Alexander Miller, who is giving us a talk about contextualization of religious conversion um, uh, from a, a different perspective. And on the 17th, September 17th, we have Dr. Konsantan and September, we have Dr. Catherine Croft. And uh, 1st October, I will present also a lecture. Mine will be more how did the conversion um, process influence the conversion process of the conference. Now, with this, allow me to introduce our very distinguished uh, lecture today, uh, um, Dr. Uh, Professor, Reverend Professor Maksud. Uh, the Dr. Maksud Kamil was one of our alumni. He did his PhD here at uh, OCMS uh, Middlesex University. Um, he's an ordained minister of the Presbyterian Church of Pakistan and is also a distinguished leader with uh, over 35 years of experience. And uh, Dr. Maksud, I have to say, don't look 35 years of experience. <laughs> I mean, you are too young to have. <laughs> that means you are you start very early age in the leadership and the academia. Um, he is um, uh, his ex his experience uh, are in church leadership, pastoral development, youth development, theological education, and interfaith specialist. He has served as a professor of systematic theology and hermeneutics. He is also vice principal at uh, Gujaranwala Theological Seminary and executive secretary of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church of Pakistan. His contributions extend globally through his extensive preaching, teaching, authorship of several theological books and numerous articles and active participation in international forums and organization. Dr. Kamil is deeply committed to the development of church, youth, and church leadership. And he is currently serving as a strategic advisor in Park Mission Society and president of Arata Institution of Leadership and Management. With that, I would uh, welcome you, uh, Dr. Maksud, um, uh, and to um, lead us and to inspire us with your lecture on the topic of religious conversion, and I will just give the screen to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Sarah. It's a, a joy to join you all, and uh, particularly, you know, uh, 
because OCMS was uh, how, uh, home for me for many years, as uh, just as you friends are, uh, you know, studying for my PhD uh, from 2012 onward till 2029, and uh, uh, the same lecture hall where and you are sitting now uh, was a joy to sit and present seminars and be part of that and listen to the lectures. And uh, so grateful for this opportunity. Uh, thank you very much. And also very happy to see Jonathan, uh, some of the uh, you know faces <laughs> you know, uh, can recognize and know very well. Uh, Sarah, you of course, and I saw Sibi somewhere, but I think he has disappeared. Uh, so uh, it's, it's really a, a joy uh, for me to uh, be here. Uh, I will uh, be talking about, uh, uh, you know, this um, uh, subject uh, which has been advertised and uh, let me uh, share if, uh, if I may my um, screen with you. Internet here is a little bad and I've been struggling to, uh, you know, connect. Um, seems like it takes ages. Zara uh, Kublai, that is question. Share Karim. Um, can you guys see my screen or not? No, yet? we are not seeing your screen. Yeah, it, it's a little bit of a trouble here with my internet not functioning so smoothly. Yes, okay. I, it's coming. Okay, I have a little assistant here, <laughs> my my daughter who helps me out. Um, so, um, Anjam Bakhar, or a search for the uh, good end, uh, in which we will be exploring the journey of a restless uh, Muslim to Christ. So this is, uh, uh, you know, very important uh, topic to my heart, uh, very important subject. And I love, uh, you know, uh, to share with all of you. Um, so, uh, the conversion of uh, an individual or a group of people from the faith, one faith to another, has been, of course, a very fascinating uh, phenomena and a field of studies for decades. It arouses the feeling, feelings of excitement, joy, deep satisfaction, hatred, abandonment, passive and active persecution, and raises a host of complex issues related to this particular phenomenon. People have found life in the act of conversion, but at the same time, many have died for making such a decision. Countless individuals are at the crossroads of making decision to leave their former faith and embrace the faith of their choice as we speak. Yet out of the fear of losing their very life, they want to save. They are unable to take this step towards conversion. While propagators of almost every faith go out to proclaim their faith and invite people to convert to their perceived truth, Christianity and Islam are the two most missionary religions on earth, both striving to win the followers of other faith over to their own. To that effect, there have been many different approaches taken by the proponents of both religions, including preaching, publishing apologetic literature, and facing off with each other on public munazarat or debates, while religious people, and especially the apologists of each religion, debate over the competing 
truth claims and other debates why people convert also continues. There is a plenty of uh, literature exploring the answer to this very question. Theologians, missiologists, anthropologists, and sociologists have developed theories to understand this very question. Why do people convert? I will not enter into this debate today. The main purpose of today's lecture is to explore the journey of a restless Orthodox Sunni scholar turned Sufi, Reverend Dr. Malvi Imaduddin Lahas, who was born in 1830 and uh, slept in the Lord in 1900. In his restless search for gaining the paradise, or what he called the Anjam Bukhar, or the good end. And how did he find that desire of his heart, if he ever find it? So this will be, uh, you know, the purpose of uh, this lecture uh, to uh, find it out. Now, it is important to know, of course, who was Imaduddin. Imaduddin, or his full name, Malvi Padri, or Pastor Imaduddin Lahiz, he was a 19th century Indian Muslim alim, meaning scholar, imam, and a Sufi, who vigorously opposed the Western missionaries and was an avowed enemy of Christianity. At one of the most well-known Christian Muslim encounters in the subcontinent, which is known as the Great Debate of Agra 1854 between the two most eminent representatives of Christianity and Islam, representing Christianity, the main debater, Arman Nasser, was uh, Karl Gottlieb Funder, a Swiss-German missionary to Muslims, a renowned missionary, and Malvi Rahmatullah Kiranvi, uh, who came to be known as uh, one of the best Muslim apologists, still is one of the top 10 Muslim apologists. He was, uh, so uh, Amaduddin was very closely associated with Rahmatullah Kiranvi at the debate as well. He was present and uh, was there as an assistant Malvi to uh, Malvi Rahmatullah Kiranvi. Uh, on April 29, 1866, Imaduddin converted to Christianity. And the story of his uh, uh, conversion and service to Christ is one of the most inspiring stories of all time, the conversion stories. Now, you might be thinking of, you know, what does Malvi Imaduddin look like? So here is... The only uh, somewhat clear picture that we can find it out from a missionary literature or uh, from the internet, um, he converted to Christianity, uh, but he was, uh, you know, man of his own will and his own mind, not easily given into, you know, conformity. So he retained his title as Malvi. Uh, he retained his, uh, uh, you know, clothing just like that. And he never uh, removed the title uh, Malvi also. So he looked like Malvi all his life. But after conversion, of course, he uh, looked like a Christian Malvi. Now, uh, he has written many books, uh, some, some you know, uh, remarks in different books are that he wrote big and small around 53 uh, books. Uh, which I have recovered around 34, but uh, I haven't found it all. Uh, but the main uh, sources of his biographical information or where he mostly talks about his uh, uh, journey from Islam to Christianity are found in these three uh, uh, small uh, books, booklets or books, you can call it. First of all is his uh, uh, autobiography that he wrote, which is called Vakyate Imadiya. And uh, uh, Vakyate Imadiya is uh, translated into like the uh, 
uh, accounts concerning uh, the life of Imaduddin or uh, you know the incidents uh, uh, concerning Imaduddin. Uh, that was written immediately after his conversion in 1866. Uh, and uh, it went all over the world. It was translated into many, many different languages, um, including the Arabic and Chinese languages. And uh, uh, the last known edition of this, um, you know, Wakya Te Madhya or his autobiography, uh, which first came very quickly after his conversion, was uh, published in 1951. Then the second booklet is uh, uh, called uh, Intisabul Imad. Intisabul Imad was written 20 years after his uh, uh, conversion. Intisabul Imad is basically, uh, you know, the documentation and uh, uh, you know the record of his uh, uh, genealogical links, where from he came, where were his roots. And uh, who was he and who were his forebears? So it traces up to 34, uh, 30 generations of his uh, ancestors, which he believed were all Muslims. Um, so uh, Intasab, Intasabulam Ad is his gene genealogy, study of his genealogy. And then you have his last main uh, source of his biography, which is called Khate Chicago, or the letter uh, that was sent to the Parliament of World Religions held in Chicago in 1893. Uh, Imad back then has become quite old and frail, and he was invited to be the participant and presenter at the Chicago uh, Parliament of World Religions, but he excused himself because of his age and travel difficulties, but he wrote uh, a letter which basically explores uh, the effects of the gospel among the Muslims of Indian subcontinent. And uh, in the beginning, he tells that he himself was a Muslim at some time and how he came to the Lord. And uh, in that, he gives 117 names of highborn or notable Muslims who came to Now, uh, Imaduddin, had, uh, just as I said, a very long history. He said uh, he knew that 30 generations of his forefathers were all Muslims. And uh, then he had very, very strong um, Islamic, Islamic roots. And uh, uh, that's one of the very exciting uh, study as well to know. So, you know, um, what do we know about Imaduddin before his conversion? That is very important aspect to explore his journey uh, to, uh, to the Lord. Uh, so there is, just I said, a no, uh, currently no detailed biographical study. And uh, uh, most of the information is coming from the three uh, booklets which I have uh, just mentioned. Um, in Wakyate Imadiya, uh, you know, uh, he tells us that uh, uh, he was born around uh, 1930. That was the year of his birth, although he came from a very uh, highly educated family, but the exact date of his birth is not known. He was born in the historic city of Panipat, which is about 995 uh, kilometers north of Delhi in the state of Haryana, present state of Haryana. Uh, for this connection, sometime he was addressed uh, as uh, Panipati. His uh, opponent Muslims would many times call him just Panipati. Uh, Imaduddin was born uh, to uh, an Ashraf family, Ashraf Muslim family, meaning the those who traced their uh, roots outside of India as uh, immigrant, either Arabs or uh, the Iranians or the Middle Easterns, uh, they were very much proud of their genealogy. Uh, um, you know, uh, their ancestry they traced outside of India. In Wakyate Imadia, he gave the short genealogy and, uh, uh, you know, just uh, about, uh, uh, you know, um, the generation uh, of his uh, uh, forebears he basically noted. 
um, Sheikh, he tells is, uh, you know, about his genealogy, that Sheikh Jamaluddin, the son was Sheikh Jalaluddin, and his son was Sheikh Fateh Muhammad, his son was Malvi Muhammad Sardar, his son was Malvi Muhammad Fazil, and his son was Malvi Muhammad Sirajuddin, whose son, he said, uh, Imaduddin was. So Imaduddin, uh, son of Sirajuddin, son of Muhammad Fazil, and son of Muhammad Sardar, son of Ma Fateh Muhammad, son of Jalaluddin, and then son of Qutb Sheikh Jamaluddin. Now, this particular name uh, strikes, you know, very important to note, Sheikh Qutb Jamaluddin. The history he traced and uh, uh, much of other Muslim literature that talks about Qutb Sheikh Jamaluddin. Qutb Sheikh Jamaluddin uh, was a Sufi saint uh, of India, and uh, uh, his tomb is still being revered, revered in um, uh, Hansi in, in, in India. He is one of the very well renowned, uh, you know, Qutb and in the hierarchy of uh, Sufism, and his his tomb is still being revered. Uh, Few of his sons also reached that status of being Qutbs uh, in Sufi hierarchy. And his direct link is connected with uh, Imam Abu Hanifa. And now you will know those who are interested in Islam that uh, Imam Abu Hanifa is one of the most important uh, uh, Imams in Islam. Uh, he is uh, said to be the second most important miracle of the Prophet of Islam after Quran. Quran is the, the miracle of the Prophet of Islam. But then after that, uh, he is considered to be the greatest miracle of the Prophet of Islam. Uh, he is called also, uh, you know, the Imam Azam or the greatest Imam as well as the Siraj, Sirajul, um, um, Siraj, Sirajul Imams, meaning uh, the, or, uh, you know, the, or the ladder, the lamp of the uh, Imams. So it's a very, very important figure. Of course, the founder of uh, uh, Hanafi School of Jurisprudence and, uh, uh, you know, the majority of the subcontinent people uh, Indian subcontinent people, uh, they are the followers of this particular uh, jurisprudence, school of jurisprudence that they are there. So you find it out that uh, uh, Imaduddin connected with his Islamic roots is so very, very important that his direct link through Sheikh Qutb Jamaluddin, who was his great grandfather, is uh, directly linked with Imam Abu Hanifa. So, you know, the scholarly and the imami, uh, you know, hierarchy, as well as the Sufi hierarchy, where he belongs to, is something which was uh, very, very important and uh, something which would have obviously uh, be, a, a, be a big, a big a hurdle uh, in his way to accept Christianity and leave Islam. So for 30 generations, he said, I know by heart the name of my 34 fathers that they were all Muslims. Uh, very, very strong Islamic roots indeed. Uh, his own uh, family, his father was extremely religious person. And even towards the end of his days of life, uh, he said he was constantly spending time in night vigils, and in uh, uh, reading wazifa, reciting wazifas and um, act of worship. And literature tells that even in a very difficult uh, uh, circumstances in the Indian subcontinent during the last days of Mughal Empire, a couple of women from his family, they went to perform Hajj in a very dangerous time. So the family roots were very, very uh, Islamic, deep, and he himself from the childhood was extremely 
religious and he was raised in an extremely religious environment. Uh, from the very beginning, as a childhood, he was searching for God. Somehow it was innate that from the childhood his eyes were fixed at the end. What would happen at the end when he will rise on the day of uh, reckoning and will have to stand before Allah, what will happen to him? And uh, then he had, uh, you know, somehow it from some preachers of Islam from the mosque that, uh, uh, you know, uh, knowing Allah uh, is the uh, purpose of all knowledge and only knowing Allah will save them. Uh, so uh, he said that from, from his childhood, all the purpose of his studies were to you know, um, know Allah, and uh, 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 he he did not left any stone unturned to do that. So, um, Panipat's religious, where, where he was grown, um, uh, you know, religious environment as well as his own family's filial relation with a highly venerated Sufi saint, such as Kutub Jamaluddin, and the love for learning in Islam, inspired Ahmaduddin from the childhood to master Islamic sciences and serve Islam entire his entire life. Ahmaduddin tells in his biographical accounts that he was 15 or 16 years of age when he left Panipat and moved to Akbarabad, which was later called Agra. It is near Delhi, where iconic Taj Mahal is situated. Some of you might have visited. I have never had a chance to visit yet, but it is uh, uh, one of the wonders of the world. And uh, that's the city where he went for study. And he went there for the sake of gaining knowledge so that he could know Allah. So all he said his studies were like he is worshiping to know Allah and have union with him. He also informs his readers that the sole purpose of his strenuous study was to find God. He read and searched books, visited Malwis, Fakirs, those uh, who have abandoned the world and, you know, the just uh, for the sake of Allah. Uh, saints dead and alive sat on the graves of holy men, became himself Sufi and Fakir, and suffered every suffering in the power of man to suffer only to find the truth. Uh, Rajya de Paul, uh, you know, wrote, and I am quoting here uh, Rajya de Paul, uh, about the, you know, sufferings that he went through. He said about Madhudin, he was ever a seeker after truth and was not satisfied by uh, un uh, ununderstanding orthodoxy or mere conformity to accepted practices and patterns of thought. He wanted true inward peace and not outward respectability. He would not believe anything unless he had tested it not only with his intellect, but also with its spiritual effects. Early he became dissatisfied with the ordinary system of Islam and became a Sufi. He was willing to pay any price. Just hear these words carefully. He was willing to pay any price to get satisfaction for his spiritual longings and was therefore unremitting in his search for soul satisfaction. His eager search for the pearl of great price was long and arduous he subjected himself to the utmost self-mortification in his efforts to attain peace, unquote. He further wrote, Imaduddin, I'm quoting again, was for years before his conversion an ardent, an ardent seeker after truth, and his ardour was immeasurable and unquenchable. He was prepared to do anything, go to any length, suffer any privation, and undergo any self-mortification 
if only he could find the truth. Unquote. He was a determined, Dimaduddin was a determined seeker after truth, which prolonged for many years. Of course, one should say, uh, you know, how many ask, how many years? Um, Avril and Powell, who has done a number of studies on him, and is a, she is an, uh, you know, um, authority on uh, Indian Christian mission history and uh, uh, these conversion stories, especially, um, uh, you know, her, uh, her book published in 19, um, uh, 1993, uh, that is very, very important book and the other many articles. She, she said the Madhudin search to find truth seemed to have lasted for 10 years, dating from some point in his student years, uh, which were like, you know, 1846 to 51, uh, until 1860s, unquote. However, my own studies uh, and uh, shows that a closer analysis would suggest that the period of his struggle was twice as much as Powell seems to suggest. He was 15 or 16 years of old when he entered the college in Agra, government college in Agra. So the years of his you know, student life from 1845 to 46 or to you know, 1851, uh, seems to be right. Uh, it was during this college life that he began to doubt the truthfulness of Islam. We will come later to, uh, to this. It was during this time that he had heard a catechist preaching, perhaps somewhere in Bazaar preaching, which impressed him and he went uh, to that catechist study to converse with him about the Christian faith. To that catechist study, uh, um, I mean, it was during this time that Safdar Ali, one of his close college friend and lifelong friend, took him to Malvi Abdul Halim, uh, who was a Malvi uh, uh, in uh, Agra, to answer his questions about Islam. Although Malvi Abdul Halim's severe and frightening admonition put him off from some time, put him off for some time, yet raising such difficult question that an Islamic scholar of the caliber of Malvi, Abdul Halim could not answer, was the real beginning of his struggle for the truth. Ahmaduddin made his public confession of faith um, on April 29, 1866, and was baptized by, uh, at Amritsar by Reverend Robert Clark. So from the beginning of the doubts about Islam in his mind to the actual confession of faith in Christ are actually 20 years. So his search continued for 20 years. Imaduddin himself confirmed this when he introduced, uh, uh, when the intro his introduction in his first book, Tahqiq ul Iman, uh, Tahqiq ul Iman, which means investigation of faith was one uh, of the very important first book he wrote in refutation of, uh, um, you know, Ramatullah and Wazir Khan's uh, Ijaz Iswe. So he wrote, I have been in search of the will of God for the last 20 years. So he himself says 20 years. This indeed is a very long struggle and clearly suggests the audacity, tenacity, and most relentless pursuit of truth that any individual could ever dare to have. Now, Imaduddin wrote, and I am quoting, when I was 15 years old, I left my friends and relatives for my education and went to Agra, where my brother Malvi Karimuddin was head of the Urdu department. I remained there a long time under him to receive instruction as my only object in learning was, as my only object in learning was, in some way or the other to find my Lord. As soon as I had leisure from the study, I began to wait on fakirs, fakirs being those, uh, you know, wandering Muslims who have, uh, you know, abandoned the world, 
uh, opted, uh, the, mm, and taken the vows of poverty, and uh, it is said their only possession was Allah. So he began to wait on fakirs and pious and random men to discover the advantages of religion. I frequented the mosques and khankas. Khankas are, you know, the uh, Sufi saints like abbeys um, and the homes of the Malvis and carried on my studies in Muhammadan, Muhammadan law, the commentaries of the Quran and the Hadith, manners, logic and philosophy. In those days, due to my fellowship with some Christians, I became doubtful about the religion of Muhammad. But the taunting curses of the Malwis and Muhammadans so confounded me that I quickly drew back. I quickly drew uh, drew back from uh, such thoughts. Even my friend uh, Saf Malwi Safdar Ali, um, deputy inspector of school in Jabalpur who was then my class fellow in Agra College and most bigoted and staunch Muslim, although I am witness to his honesty, righteousness, and good conduct and academic abilities, was deeply sorrowful when he discovered the doubts in my heart. He said to me, behold, you are going astray. You have not read the books of religion as yet. Christians have led you astray. He said to me, dispel this doubt of your heart and read the books, the religion of Muhammad thoughtfully and then see who is right. Then Malvi Sabdar Ali took me to Malvi Abdul Hali, one of the retinues of the Nawab of Banda, who was a very learned man and a preacher of Islam. At that time, I was reading the book called Hamdallah, Praise Allah. I presented my objections to him before him. And although he was unable to answer them, he repeated several verses from the Quran and showed so much temper that we both were so soon weary of him and got up and went away. From that day, I let this doubt, uh, the thoughts of doubt go and started studying day and night for the next eight to ten years. Um, uh, sorry, my um, slides have changed, but uh, I will. I'll come back to that. Um, so it has been noted uh, that from his earliest days he was nourished in the best of Islam uh, Islam has to give and after preliminary education in his own uh, town, he passed on to the royal cities of Delhi and Agra, and there, under the best masters of that time, he so perfected himself as to become, at an early age, himself a master in Islam. We find him as a young man full of Muslim bigotry and fanaticism, arrayed against Dr. Fonder and Mr. French in the famous discussion with Muhammadans at Agra. Now, it appears that this, it, at his great learning, has made him quite proud. In Imaduddin's own words, and I quote, when I had gained essential knowledge of Islam and was filled with Muhammadan prejudice, unquote, he was among the circle of ulema, meaning uh, religious scholars of Islam, who in Agra in early 1850s attempted to refute the balance of truth. His uh, learning as a Muslim Malvi was well recognized by the great Muslim scholars of his day. He was closely connected with the renowned ulama of Delhi and Agra, especially Rahmatullah Kiranvi, 
Malvi Muhammad Mazhar and Dr. Wazir Khan. After his death, it was noted in the Church Missionary Intelligencer. Uh, Church Missionary Intelligencer was a magazine that was, uh, you know, reporting uh, for the CMH, uh, you know, such stories from all over the mission field, that he studied Islam under the best masters of his time. Ireland Jones identified one of the best of those masters of Islam as Rahmatullah himself. And he said that Imaduddin was a devoted disciple of famous Rahmatullah, unquote. Safdar Ali remarked that when Imaduddin became Sufi, he became the disciple of the light of Sufism. From the classical study of Islam, he turned to acquire Il Messina. You uh, see that, you know, it's a two kinds of knowledge uh, that Sufis or Islamic tradition tells. There is uh, Il Messina and Il Safina, the knowledge of the, you know, uh, head and the knowledge of the heart. So the traditional Islamic laws, they are considered just, you know, the outward expression, but the real knowledge uh, Sufis, and it is said they are, it is with the Sufis called Il Messina, the knowledge of the heart, which uh, supposedly to have been imparted by Prophet Muhammad to his close companions and has been transmitted secretly by the masters to their disciples. This knowledge is to be found with Sufis, it is said. The Il Messina is called the Sawaf or Sufism or Islamic mysticism. In his effort to find the truth and union with God, he was determined to plumb the deepest depth of Sufism by methodically implementing the practices enjoined by the Qadriya order. He writes, Imaduddin writes, and I am quoting, I chose to speak little, eat little, remained aloof from people, afflicted my body and stayed awake during the night. I began to recite the Quran all night. I continuously repeated Qasida about uh, Ghaus, uh, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jalani, which is who is called, you know, the Ghaus Yazim. I recited Shahal Kaf and Hizbul Bahar. These are very, uh, you know, technical terms. Uh, uh, I will, uh, you know, if need, need be, I will explain these later. I meditated and practiced abst abstinence. Um, I performed the dhikr loudly and silently. I sat in seclusion with closed eyes and mentally began to write the name or the word Allah on my heart. While at the graves of the saints, I meditated hoping to receive illumination from their graves. I attended the Sufi assemblies confidently gazing upon their faces of the Sufis, anticipating a flow of light from their direction. Through their intercession, I constantly besought union with God. In addition to the five regular prayers, I performed the night, early morning, and midnight uh, prayers. I went on repeating the confession of faith and invoking blessings upon Muhammad. In short, whatever troubles are in the power of man to bear, I have borne them and suffered them in their fullest intensity, unquote. Amaduddin's description of his suffering for the sake of finding truth is aptly summarized by Rajya Dipal. I quote, Imaduddin was for years before his conversion an ardent seeker after truth, and his archer was immeasurable and unquenchable. He was prepared to do anything, go to any length, suffer any privation, and undergo any self-mortification only if he could find the truth. Dear friend, this determination to find God and have union with him at any cost convinced him to take the final and most dangerous route uh, through performing the rites of Hizbul Bahar 
so that according to the beliefs of the Sufis, Hizbul Bahar, uh, he recalled, he might meet God. He became a fakir, walked 2,000 course or 4,000 kilometers through the jungles and arrived in a place called Karoli and sat by the stream called Cholidar, which, which was flowing through the mountains and started practicing these 12 days of extreme exercises of Hizbul Bahar. Hizbul Bahar means the party of the, of the sea, including that included these fasting, writing the name of Allah on the heart, writing uh, the name of Allah 125,000 times on the paper, cutting it individually, rolling it in the dough and feeding the fish, and at the same time, trying to write the name of Allah uh, on one's heart. It was promised that at the completion of Hizbul Bahar, he would meet God. However, at the completion of this rite, Imaduddin described his condition in these words. I quote, When I finished this labor, no strength remained in my body. I was pale. I could not remain standing again. Unquote. He put it succinctly, and I quote, Whatever trouble is in the power of man to suffer, I suffered to the fullest intensity, only to find the truth. Unquote. Safdar Ali described the intensity, force, vigor, and sincerity with which Madhudin strived to find Allah from his young age in these words. Listen what his, you know, uh, student friend wrote about him later on. It is the fact, I'm quoting Safdar Ali, it is the fact that Reverend Malvi Imaduddin and I have been friends, I have been friends, uh, battery there. I have been friends in a religion ever since we were a student together in Agra now more than 45 years ago. While we were yet Muhammadans, we were never in accord in matters concerning that faith. He was not only staunch, but an ardent and intolerant Sunni. While I, though Sunni, was a tafziliya in heart. A while, Malvi Imaduddin became a Ghair Mukallid, while I was firm Mukallid Hanafi. He then became a big and I abjure, abjuring alike. Wahhabis and heretics walked in the plain middle path of orthodoxy. Finally, Imaduddin became a Sufi and the disciple of the light of Sufism. While I for long declined even to turn my mind to the teaching of this sect, though in the end I too accepted their faith. Nevertheless, we differed uh, for a while he was in the state of succor. Succor means like a madness out beside oneself. I was in a half, meaning, uh, you know, quite sober. Now, thus you see that uh, uh, his love for learning and knowing God knew no bounds. He left no stone unturned to know God and have union with him. So he was just in his search for God and knowing the truth and finding God. But then we come to, uh, you know, his search of uh, uh, the good end. And um, uh, it appears from his uh, several writings that Imaduddin's eyes were fixed at the end. This is very important throughout our discussion. That his eyes were fixed at the very end, from the very beginning. What would be his fate when he will stand in the presence of God on the Day of Judgment? Even as a teenager, he was striving to ensure that his end will be good. And this angst 
about the end was throwing him into spiritual crisis. Imaduddin's spiritual crisis seems to have started as early as in his teen years when he was in Agra. Although he was born and nourished in a deeply religious and scholarly Muslim family, it seems in the depth of his heart he had no substantial and meaningful relationship with God and no certainty that he will enter paradise. At this early age, signs of spiritual crisis seems obvious. He wrote, When I was 15 years old, I left my friends and relatives for my education and went to Agra, where my brother Malvi Karimodin was head of the Urdu department. I remained there a long time and uh, with him and to receive for in receiving instructions as my only object in learning was in some way or the other to find my Lord. As soon as I had leisure from the study, I began to wait on fakirs and pious men and learned men and discovered the advantages of religion. I frequented the mosques and khankas and the homes of the Malvis and carried on my studies in the Muhammadan law, the commentaries, the Quran, the hadith, the manner, the logic, and philosophy. In those days, due to my fellowship with some Christians, I became doubtful uh, about the religion of Muhammad, but the taunting curses of Malvis and uh, Muhammadans so confounded me that I quickly drew back from uh, all such thoughts. Although doubts about Islam were suppressed by him, yet his spiritual crisis appears to have continued. By this time, he had become a learned Muslim scholar who was full of Muslim bigotry in his own words, yet he had no spiritual satisfaction and certainty of his good end or in John Bukhar when he would die. He practiced all rites and austerities of the Sufism. He stated the stated purpose of all his studies and intensive and extreme acts of worship was he, uh, as he puts it, or sirf khuda se ye sunne ka mushtaq tha ke tera anjam bakhair hai. Urdu mein, uh, these are Urdu words I am reading from his biography. Or sirf khuda se ye sunne ka mushtaq tha ke tera anjam bakhair hai. And my only desire, I'm translating, was to hear from God that your end is good. He was in search of the good news of the good end vis-a-vis -vis the obvious and bad news of the bad end which was plumbing him into the deep spiritual crisis. It appears that the main reason for his spiritual crisis was the Quran itself. Very strange. He wrote the following verse of the Quran was all the time piercing my heart like a thorn. This verse I am uh, quoting now from Surah 19, verse 71. It says, Every mortal necessarily must once go to hell. It is obligatory on God to send all men necessarily once to hell, and afterwards he may pardon whom he will. Other, uh, you know, the translations say that they say the decree decided by Allah. So everyone will have to enter hell once. This verse brought constant sorrow into his heart. Although he was preaching from the royal mosque in Agra, he was imam of the royal mosque of Agra, his spiritual crisis was deepening all the time. The following excerpts from his autobiography demonstrate this very clearly. I quote, In the midst of thoughts like these, my only comfort was engaging in constant acts of worship. I used to retire into my private chamber, and with many tears I prayed for the pardon of my sins. I often went and spent half of the night in silence at the tomb of Shah Abdul Allah, 
I used to take my petitions with joy to the shrine of Bu Ali Kalandar and to the threshold of Nizamuddin Aliya and to the graves of other saints. I sought for union with God from the travelers and fakirs and even from the insane people uh, of the city in accordance with the tenets of Sufi beliefs, unquote. Even this did not satisfy the inner longings of his soul, and his spiritual crisis seems to have hit the deepest depth of his being, and he decided to take the most desperate step to resolve his inner perplexity and ensure that he will meet God and his end will be good. He recorded, uh, Sorry, Dr. Maxwell. After renouncing, you have uh, you um, actually finished the time. Can you wrap up in five minutes? So we in will have minutes. some time for question and the answer, please. Okay. Yes, yeah, thank you. Sorry five about that. Five minutes seems to be too little, but uh, uh, let me see. <laughs> so, you know, um, the thing is that he renounced the world. He, he left everything and... Uh, uh, he engaged himself into the deeper devotions and went to uh, the jungles and performed the rites of Hizbar Bahar I uh, earlier mentioned. And uh, uh, at the end of the, you know, the whole exercises, uh, you know, he, he became very, very disappointed that he was unable to find, uh, find uh, rest and peace or the good end uh, now for his soul. Now, uh, we quickly move to finding the good and rest for this for his soul. Now, he was deeply disappointed and went back to uh, his city, Panipat. From there, in 1854, uh, he came to Lahore, where he was appointed as a teacher, one of the teachers at the teacher training school, where he met uh, um, uh, the principal of that school, whose name was Mr. McIntosh. So one day they were uh, talking about the religion and how, uh, which religion might be true, although he had been disappointed, but yet he held that Islam was the only true religion. But when he was challenged by um, uh, McIntosh, whether he has considered Christianity, first he said yes, but then he confessed that he has only read the apologetic literature written by Muslims, and uh, he considered that the Muslims have proved at the great debate of Agra 1854 that Christianity was false. But then that uh, uh, principal Macintosh challenged him. He said, well, you have not read uh, the Bible, and uh, you are just a mukallad or a just a you know, blind follower of other Muslims. When you will appear in the day of judgment before God, how will you answer him? You have not done your research. So that, you know, struck him very deeply. And uh, 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 at the same time, the conversion, the news of conversion of his friend, um, Safdar Ali came, who had earlier, you know, tried to stop him from converting to Christianity. And he determined to win him back, Safdar Ali, to win Safdar Ali back uh, to Islam and started rereading the apologetic literatures written by Muslims and Christians, as well as first time he started reading the Gospels. And in his own words, when he had read only to the point of seventh chapter of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, the doubts about Islam took a strong hold on his heart and from there on, two years, day and night, he researched and searched and uh, discussed it with pastors and Malvis, uh, you know, and finally came to the conclusion that Islam uh, was not the true religion and uh, uh, salvation is to be found only in Christianity and the good end has to be uh, is only in Jesus and accepting Jesus alone. So then he, uh, you know, talked with his, some very close friends and uh, asked them to stop him from becoming Christian if they can convince him with convincing proofs that Islam is the true religion. They failed 
and they asked him not to convert openly but believe you know silently and uh, be a silent follower of Christ but he rejected that and uh, uh, you know a hypocritical lifestyle and he went to uh, Amr where he was baptized uh, by the Robert uh, missionary Robert Clark and he became Christian after uh, he has been converted he uh, wrote his autobiography and uh, in his autobiography then he puts uh, you know the impressions how the change has come how the good end has changed him uh, after that his life remained constantly under threat however he found the good end in Christ and Christianity and the certainty that akbat bakhair sirf isi se hoti hai that the good end are the uh, you know the, uh, the eternal life is uh, uh, secured and preserved only in christianity he noted the immediate effects of his conversion uh, in these words he said since my entrance into the grace of our lord jesus christ i have had great peace in my soul the agitation of my mind and restlessness of which i have spoken have entirely left me even the paleness of face has disappeared and my health is improved my heart never panics or perplex concerning the resurrection and the judgment day at any time now by rendering by reading the word of god i received the joy of life the disease of the fear of death and the grave has been much alleviated i rejoice greatly in my lord and my soul is always making progress in his grace the lord gives me peace uh, lord gives peace to my soul after 7 years he uh, he wrote an appendix to his autobiography and then he noted also how he has been constantly growing in faith and joy and although his life was threatened all the time uh, he had found the peace the peace that nobody could take away from him now let me read quickly the conclusion and uh, uh, i think then uh, we can open it up imaduddin was recognized as the most important and the greatest muslim convert to christianity in uh, uh, the 19th century of south asia the story of his conversion is also one of the most telling stories of a sincere seeker after the truth and the one whose eyes were fixed at the akhirat or akhirat which means the day of judgment from his teen years he left no stone unturned to escape the wrath of allah and the to escape the hell which is uh, you know prescribed in surah 19 verse 71 on the day of reckoning he experimented with the experience and almost every tradition within the sunni islam as attested by his lifelong friend safdar ali he moved from becoming a staunch ardent and intolerant sunni to ghair mukallad to bigoted wahhabi and finally a sufi who was in the state of sakar However, he found no hope within the orthodox Sunni or Sufi Islam. The process of his conversion strongly influenced by his own Islamic heritage. I am uh, repeating it. The process of his conversion was strongly influenced by his own Islamic heritage. He explored classic Islam through the study of its sacred sources, commentaries, logic, and tradition. He experimented with the mystic tradition of Islam and the high, at the highest and deepest level. The inability of Islam to satisfy the deepest longing of his soul and give him a sure a hope of the good end and uh, had unconsciously uh, prepared him to search the good end outside of the circle of Islam. Missionary interventions at important uh, turns like in Agra and Lahore, also played a crucial role. However, conversion of his bosom friend, Malvi Safdar Ali, proved to be a genuine trigger point that thrust him into an intensive study 
of the Urdu language apologetic literature as well as the direct reading of the Urdu Bible to compare Islam and Christianity and brought him to the conclusion that the good end was ensured by believing in Christ alone. It seems that the deep sense of his own unworthiness, frightening message of Surah Maryam, Surah 19, verse 71, Prophet Muhammad's inability to intercede, helplessness in the day of judgment, plunged him into the immense spiritual and existential crisis. And his in-depth empirical and intellectual knowledge of Islam and its followers completely disappointed him. Missionaries played important role in the beginning by creating doubts about Islam in him and at the end by helping him to understand the word of God and uh, that convinced him, his brilliant mind, to the truth of Christianity. Conversion stories, spiritual crisis theories, intellectual cognitive process, ecstatic convert syndrome, sudden illumination and spiritual reorientation of the soul, or the conversion stages theories, put together many of these help us to understand some aspect of his conversion, but none alone will be able to explain it fully. Powell described his conversion as a long drawn out spiritual crisis. However, from the very, his very long struggle up to conversion, it appears that it was far more complex than just the spiritual crisis. Jeffrey Odi uh, captures this uh, in this, uh, you know, uh, short sentence. The conversion experience of Nehemiah Gore, I'm quoting, Ram Chandra and above all Madhudin, all suggest long drawn out ordeals in which the intellectual and spiritual elements are separately identifiable yet intertwined. Imaduddin called his conversion a transformation from error to truth and light, darkness to light. Moreover, he considered his conversion as the act of God that captured him from the stronghold of Islam for his glory. Uh, I will stop here. I know the time is over. So um, uh, we can um, uh, then, you know, uh, engage maybe in our uh, discussion. Thanks so much. Can you stop sharing, please? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I will do so that. Uh, okay. Pause sharing. Where is it? Um, let me put it down. Uh, that, can you see it? No, not yet. Yeah, I'm still seeing it. All right, where have it gone? Just hold on for a second. Zara? Zara? Bakya? Uh, anyway, while uh, we are waiting for uh, someone to come and uh, stop the video, I mean, stop sharing, I just want to thank you, Dr. Maksud, for this very interesting uh, lecture, and especially uh, uh, demonstrating how the deconversion process of Ahmad Din helped him to understand uh, his conversion process to Christianity and then how from a troubled soul to find peace in Christ. So in this, uh, I would leave it um, the, uh, uh, for the question and the people on the Zoom, if you have any question, please raise your hand, use the, uh, this image of, uh, in the bottom of your computer uh, raise your hand. I will call you to unmute yourself and, and ask your question. Can you please also be brief? We have only 15 minutes left. 
And also the same in the room. If you have any question, please raise your hand. I will ask you to ask your questions. So uh, anyone on the Zoom, do you have any question or comment? Yes, please, David, can you please unmute yourself? Yes, thank you, Maksud, um, for this presentation. Um, what a delight to see you once again. I'm sorry you sent me um, a message, but I, I was out um, along with uh, one of our new faculty members and I couldn't respond. But All I'm right. glad you got through. Got through. Um, yes, uh, I mean, two very brief, uh, brief points. Uh, I'm interested uh, especially um, in learning a bit about uh, uh, the side story of his wife and uh, his children's conversion to Christianity, because as I uh, see it, there was some resistance from his uh, wife initially, who was deeply offended by the fact that Imad Din was thinking of converting. While conversion what was not uh, as big uh, uh, an issue as uh, as baptism, uh, because that kind of declared uh, this sociological shift from Islam into into Christianity, and that was a bigger problem. Uh, so that's one. Secondly. Um, uh, in his um, uh, autobiography, uh, the one that you first referred to, he also alludes to the fact that there are a large number of uh, Muslims who are waiting to convert to Christianity, to follow Christ, but they are prevented from doing so because of the wall of law and tradition. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why he wrote his books, he says, uh, was to encourage uh, some of his friends who were kind of sitting on the fence to decide to convert to Christianity, as he did, uh, to make this decisive move from Islam into Christianity. So, I mean, there is there are some um, um, some pieces of evidence like this uh, that kind of connect his story to our understanding of. Uh, what we call the insider movement. Uh, yeah. So there are, there are, uh, I suppose, comparisons between uh, his story, at least the one that uh, is is, uh, is found in the first biography, autobiography, and and the stories uh, and and the accounts of miss missiologists on insiders. Um, thank you very much, David. It's a joy to see you. Uh, is my uh, video coming through? Anybody can see? No, I stopped. And now we can see you. Okay. Um, uh, of course, I mean, uh, it's a, it's a, some story which is so powerful, convergent story. And as many, uh, you know, are suffering now when they come to the Lord, they suffer the loss of family. Uh, that has been one of the, you know, aspect or difficult aspect of those who uh, come come from uh, other religions, particularly uh, Islam. So when he became Christian for a period of time, uh, he suffered the loss of uh, the separation of his wife and children. And uh, uh, but after, uh, you know, the uh, seven years when he wrote uh, the appendix to his uh, uh, first edition of biography, uh, one of the joy that he was uh, he was sharing was that uh, my wife, who was very angry with me, and uh, he did not accept me becoming a, a Christian, uh, you know, she, uh, she has joined me. Uh, and along with that, uh, then uh, uh, his children, all children, they also uh, were baptized. Uh, the determination that he had to stay was also very strong because uh, at 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 you know the uh, point of even losing his wife and children he was determined uh, to give his life to christ because the joy that he has found and the assurity of salvation and uh, a good end at the day of resurrection was so uh, convincing uh, uh, for him and with Christ, that he was ready to suffer any loss, uh, including the loss of his wife and children. But then he says, you know, that God had such mercy that his wife uh, became Christian with him along with his children. Uh, 
his father and at his very old age uh, he said also along with uh, uh, his one brother uh, whose name was Harodin also came to the Lord and they were converted although uh, his father uh, when he died so his uh, because his eldest brother Malvi Krimodin uh, he never converted he remained Muslim so they buried his father according to the Islamic rites of burial. But he said, you know, that he has uh, accepted Christ and he was baptized with his, uh, uh, you know, wife and children. Uh, so this was one of the great uh, joy for him that his family uh, came to the Lord. Yes, this is also one of the uh, my uh, finding through, uh, throughout his writings that when he was searching uh, for the truth and he was going through all, uh, you know, comparative study of Islam and Christianity, he was uh, discussing and, uh, uh, you know, to some extent perhaps debating with both the scholars of Islam and Christianity, whereas he was given good answers by the missionaries and local Christians um, as compared to the Muslims. But... Uh, before he converted, actually, or took the baptism, he went to his very close uh, Sufi scholar friends and shared his findings, his research findings with them. And he said, you know, uh, please stop me from becoming a Christian. I don't want to be a Christian. If you can convince me with convincing proofs, stop me. But if you can't, then come along with me and also become a Christian. So he's, he writes that they very clearly said, we know the religion of Christ is true, and uh, uh, but we cannot convert because we lose our honor, we will lose our families, uh, we will be uh, persecuted by other people. So many different excuses, and they also advised him not to convert openly, secretly follow Christ, but uh, remain Muslim outwardly, which he did not like. So, of course, uh, you know, this uh, seeds of insiders movement or you call it crypto Christians or whatever, <laughs> they were there uh, at then as well. But he said, you know, this is uh, uh, this is hypocr hypocrisy. I cannot uh, live like that. If I have found the truth, I must declare it. Insiders movement was also uh, there. People wanted uh, uh, to convert. But many of them, they were afraid that they will be cut off from their families. They will be persecuted. They will lose their wealth and um, honor. And that's one of the, I think, still very, very strong reason for anybody. Anybody to convert from Islam to Christianity because all these things are still true. Thank you. Anyone else has a question? And... Um, so uh, I have uh, a question before uh, because we only have three minutes, no, seven minutes left. Um, one of the things, uh, his story, uh, the, the way um, you are, um, you inspire us through that is his deconversion <laughs> process from the moment he doubts until the moment he become a Christian. It is a long journey, a 20 years journey of struggle, of doubt, of search and seeking. And when it comes to Christianity, this, uh, the story becomes so short, so rushed and uh, finished. That means, okay, now I, I, I reached, now I have peace and all these things. Sometimes I feel, our conversion stories are like the Hollywood movies mm -hmm. when marriage happens happily after. Mm -hmm. And that normally it's not the case. And did he go through different struggle after his conversion? Um, the, the spiritual crisis again, because mm -hmm. what I notice is his conversion was actually a mean for an end, a means for an end. His conversion was not, and to I mean, it's just it was just a means rather than the, an end to something. And did he go through another spiritual crisis 
after his conversion to Christianity. Mm. Thank you, Sarah. It's a very, very important question. And I think, uh, uh, um, you know, many, many a time uh, it is considered, you know, once somebody has converted, so the life will be easy, but uh, the life is not easy. It's very difficult. Uh, I didn't have time uh, to fully read the text that I have written. You will get it, of course, for publishing it. Uh, but, uh, you know, after... Uh, his conversion, he writes that everybody, his relatives, his friends, his disciples, everybody has become an enemy. And uh, in every way they want to afflict me, whatever way they can, they are trying to give me, you know, troubles and afflictions and all that. And it was not easy. It was very, very difficult. He was being attacked intellectually by the Muslim scholars uh, who were calling him... Uh, you know, the deficient in intellect, or he has become uh, Christian for the uh, for the sake of bread, you know. Or, you know, sometimes people, what they have upward mobility and this and that, which is not, not, not true at all. Um, but at the same time, these are, while there was, uh, we can say to religious, sociological, you know, issues, throughout his life, his life was at stake. Number of time he was sent messages that he will be killed. You know, think about that. You know, uh, uh, it is 19th century India. Uh, British government is ruling. So-called Christian government was there. And when he was translating Quran, uh, he happened to be the first person who translated Quran into idiomatic Urdu. Okay, after his conversion. So police was put uh, as a security measure at the door of his house to protect him. Uh, the prince of Chitral sent a special envoy to him, telling him that he was kafir. Uh, he has read some of his books and he considered him kafir and liable to be killed. And he would like to kill him with his own hands, you know. So it's a very interesting answer he said. He said to the envoy, please uh, tell to your master, I am grateful that he has read my books and I, I, I pray and hope that he also finds, uh, you know, the salvation and joy. But tell him if he were to kill me, out of my spilt blood, 20 Imaduddin will rise. You know, you might have heard uh, in 2013, there was a huge uh, terrorist attack in uh, in Peshawar, Pakistan, on the on the day of uh, worship. Uh, Hundred people were killed. That is the church where Imaduddin was the preacher at the consecration of that church. And when he was coming after the preaching, two Pathans were sent to kill him in the train. And they were found out and arrested by the by the police with their with their daggers. So that's a story that continued for a very very long time until until the uh, you know uh, his earthly life, all all his life he was threatened. Um, but on another level, Sarah, it is very important also for Muslims to uh, he converted and became Christian through the comparison of Christianity and Islam. He was intellectual. He had delved into the depth of Sufism also. Uh, he had not found anywhere satisfaction. And the, the person of Christ and the New Testament so deeply impressed him. Uh, the truth of uh, Christianity, he became Christian. But as you know, for Muslim background believers, it is the most difficult thing to accept Jesus as the son of God. You know, even after the conversion, they continue to struggle to accept him because from the very beginning, the childhood, you know, they, they have been uh, indoctrinated. Allah uh, does not give birth to anybody. He's not born. He is. He doesn't have son. Uh, the heaven will fall down at the thought of, you know, that Rahman has son. Uh, it, it's a blasphemy of the highest level and the believer in that will go to hell. Uh, all these things. 
So it's very difficult for any Muslim uh, background believer to accept that Christ is the Son of God. So even after his uh, 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 you know, conversion, he continued to struggle for some time. And he writes uh, in his commentary, I found it in the commentary on the uh, uh, book of Matthew, he shares this story for the encouragement of the seekers. And he tells that, you know, he continued to struggle. How could it be? Because when he was Muslim, he used to say that all the doctrines of Christianity might be true. But how could it be that Jesus is the son of God? It cannot. Mm -hmm. So he continued to struggle with that. And he said, you know, one day he was still under the struggle. Have I made the right choice? Will it be the right thing uh, at the end? Is Jesus the son of God? Or I am believing, you know, um, in Christianity and this is still the shirk and this and that. So in that kind of a thought, he said, he went up to the roof of his house at the midnight. And he cried to God and prayed and he said, God, you know, only you I love. And at the day of resurrection, I want to rise before you unashamed. Tell me if Jesus is your son, tell me. Otherwise, save me from this hell. And then he says that this, and the same night Jesus appeared to him. Jesus revealed himself to him. And whereas it was hard for him to pronounce this, that Jesus was son of God, he said this word, these words constantly keep coming out of mouth. Jesus is uh, Ibn Allah. Jesus is Ibn Allah. He is Ibn Allah. Ibn Allah, son of God, son of God, continued. And I think that moment when his conversion was completed. Yeah. And from there on, he never turned back. Even when his life was under, under threat, he did not return. And at the end, you know, when he died, that's the point which I really wanted to close was. He was little sick, very, you know, uh, for a couple of days. And he knew one week earlier before the, uh, his death, he had told his relatives that after one week, you will not see me. So he was a bit sick. He was taken to the same study where he had gone to arrange for his baptism. And he was just lying straight on the bed and looking into heaven. And his relatives thought, okay, we need to change his side. He might be tired. But when they tried to change his side, he said, no, don't do it. The door is open and the Lord is standing and waiting for me. <laughs> and he died peacefully. And that's the good end that he has achieved. That is a good end to our lecture today. Thank you so much. <laughs> that's brilliant. And uh, thank you. Please join me to thank you. Thank you very much. I hope uh, I didn't bore you guys to death. <laughs> no, thank you so much. And we are looking forward to further development of your article, your talk into article. And yeah, sure, sure. Uh, Yes, yeah, yeah. thank you so much. Uh, anyone, if you have any questions, maybe Dr. Master will stay with longer, but officially our uh, uh, meeting is, our lecture is now ended. And thank you so much for joining us and hope to see you all again next week when we have um, uh, Dr. Miller is talking about the use of an um, anthropological dimensions of Sh Shuki Kois contextualization model to provide examples of contextualization among converts from Islam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. God bless you.